for more landowners speak out about SABLs. NSO prepares for national census. And PNG Medical Board actions questioned. This is the National MTV News with Mary Bartulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Monday's news. Not many people in Waigani know about the Tavolo people of Pomio district in East New Britain. They are a group of people who own 18,000 hectares of land that has been included in a special agriculture business lease. The granting of a lease has come into conflict with an existing conservation program they have been running for the last 20 years. Now the village elders are being pressured into giving up all 18,000 hectares for logging and oil palm development. The people participated in an inquiry into SABLs headed by lawyer Alois Jerawai where they expressed their opposition to the SABL. Scott Wyde with this story. Tavolo village in the Melkoi LLG area of Pomio, East New Britain, shares common land and sea borders with West New Britain province. The community has 18,000 hectares of customary land that it owns. The land is protected as a conservation area recognized by the government. But in the last 10 years, the people's aspirations have come into conflict with a national government decision to award a special agriculture business lease that covers much of the Melkoi LLG, including land belonging to the Tavolo people. Peter Kikeleng is the ward councillor. He's seen logging followed by oil palm development in the neighbouring LLG area where local landowners have lost control of their land. Peter only found out about the proposed oil palm development on his land when he was attending a local government assembly meeting. Suppose tomorrow our population will be able to next generation. Sit down the woman by Bakarap because normally it comes through low place. I mean, actually it comes low place. Only like this is more going to happen now. Now place low garden, now place low, sit down low place by Inoga. Since getting word of the special agriculture business lease on their land, Perpetua Marangona has continued to voice her opposition. Her name was on the SABL documents as a signatory. Last year, she testified at the government inquiry into SABLs, where she told investigators that she didn't sign any agreement. You like him oil palm or not? We plan to like him oil palm or not. We go long inquiry long. When you have been across the West New Britain, I'm not speaking only as you. When I'm last to find a decision, I'm not talking on behalf of my people. I'll get a man here in the middle. I'll get a 32 planes inside the middle. I'll be talking about the same. Me no like him oil palm. I'll see me say beer. The community has been put in a position where it has to fight an expensive legal battle against the developers of the proposed SABL. With no help coming from the government, they've decided to raise 10,000 kina for the initial costs of a legal battle that could take several years. I've been going through law inquiry. Now lately, I've been going through law inquiry. 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 Stop now, you know what information to me. So, meaning also, uh, only no concern, only no capture him concern to me. Number two, Prime Minister make him plan the announcement, but you know what, Kaikai Blongan, all I say, will be stuck here. This court case will be the latest in a string of others in the Pomio district, cases taken up by landowner groups who feel they've been poorly represented. Scott Wyde, National MTV News. The National Statistics Office of Papua New Guinea is currently undergoing a two-day workshop on procurement in preparation for the 2020 National Census. This workshop, conducted by Central Supply and Tenders Board, will help the census management team to be transparent with their financial reporting. The National Statistics Office of PNG has just started preparations for the 2020 National Census. This two-day training will upskill the census management team on what good procurement is. Central Supply and Tender Board will be running the training. 
They are an agency that helps national departments, provincial administrations, public bodies and specialized supply and tender boards achieve value for money outcomes in the contracts that they establish. Through this two-day workshop, among topics covered are good procurement and standard operation procedures. This, this next two days is not only give you guys the overview of the procurement procedure and processes, but at the same time, we're trying to see you guys what are your requirements leading up to in preparation to that D-Day and what are the activities on that day that we need to discuss and I think you guys are handpicked for the obvious reason that National statistician Rocco Coloman says that procurement is a tedious process and needs transparency and proper understanding of procedures. For my office, it's about ensuring that we do things properly, but there's a lot of money, millions of Kina invested in these projects, and we want to ensure that after every project is completed, there should be an audit. And all those audits must clarify the processes. And I'm Lilian Soperakinea, National MTV News. The actions of the Papua New Guinea Medical Board have been questioned. In a series of questions to Health Minister Sepuka Temu, member for MAPRIC John Simon questioned the association between the Medical Board Chairman and a leading private health service provider. Mr Simon called for an investigation into the actions of the Board Chairman in consulting for a private health service provider whilst employed at the Port Mosby General Hospital. The Papua New Guinea Medical Board is responsible for all health professionals working in the country's health system. It is also responsible for the registration and licensing of private health facilities, as well as developing standards and upgrading procedures for health professionals. Recently, questions were raised in Parliament regarding the Board's performance, particularly that of its chairman. In a series of questions to Health Minister, MAPRIC MP John Simon questioned the association between the PNG Medical Board and a leading private health provider in the country, given that the current chairman of the Medical Board was also consulting at this private hospital. Mr. Simon also questioned the manner in which the current chairman was appointed. Can the minister confirm that the chairman of the Medical Board of Papua New Guinea does more consulting jobs at PRH as a con consultant? Then, what must be General Hospital? Can the minister also confirm that the Medical Registration Act requires that the registrar of the medical board to maintain a register to the registered practitioners and also have the registered gazetted and published annual results which helps the citizens to know which doctors they go to seek medical attention, especially the private doctors? Mr. Speaker, if these questions are true, can the board be investigated by uh, the minister to set up an inquiry and get the board investigated? In responding, Health Minister Sepuka Temu stood by the medical board, saying given the important role of the medical board in regulating all medical practitioners, the board continued to be strict, especially under the current board chairman. Anybody who does not comply with the registration law that the board is administering, they should never be registered. And of late, you may have heard that a certain organization which hires uh, <clears throat> doctors from Australia, for example, has been given notice because they have not been complying. And so I can assure the Honorable House that on the main, the board is doing a very, very good work. The current Papua New Guinea Medical Board Chairman is a very, very, very good chairman. And right now, for example, uh, he's not allowing uh, YOM ship to leave because of the issues of registering the volunteers in YOM. And that's how strict he is. And I've been talking to him. Uh, other political leaders are asking me to fast track it. But the chairman said, no, they're not complying with the law. They must comply with the law. So that's an example of how strict uh, the uh, board chairman is. Minister Sepuka, however, mooted impending changes to the country's medical registration bill to make it more conducive to the changing medical environment in the country. 
the amendment aims to include the regulation of medical practitioners engaged by private companies as well as NGOs, which is not the case at present. So we make sure that the med new medical registration uh, bill that we have worked on is now uh, being finally vetted by myself. It's on my desk at the moment to make sure it, it aligns very well with the 21st century uh, medical practices going on, both public and private. Improved roads, education and support to rural farmers will be the key agenda for the Simbu Provincial Government this year. Simbu Governor Michael Dua says improving and maintaining roads will open up other opportunities to grow and support the provincial and national economy. Governor Dua says the Provincial Government will maintain and improve current infrastructure to allow goods and services to reach his people. Speaking in Port Mosby, Governor Dua says Simbu has performed well in delivering its budgets for the past term. However, more can be done. Governor Dua said not all projected developments will be implemented. He says the 2018 budget will see road maintenance receiving about 30%. But our budget, no, we are mostly centering around uh, infrastructure like road. Uh, the main priority is road. We want to make sure people have the best road so that they, they can have access to services in town. Services must flow. Simbu is a province renowned for having the most rugged terrains and inconsistent weather climates. The province has six electorates, making it one of the most densely populated in the country. The governor says districts have been encouraged to help build roads with the provincial government. Education is the next big agenda, says Governor Dua. With TFF delays and economic constraints faced by most schools, Simbu Provincial Government wants to improve its education sector. So that's why we are going back to the basics, trying to get things in order so that we educate those small ones properly. So resources must be concentrated down there. So education is another priority we are looking for. The bulk of the Simbu population live in rural areas. However, urban drift has become a common trend in the past 10 years. The Simbu governor says going rural to empower families will see farming activities supported. But we have to look for ways to bring these people back so that they touch the ground, look after animals, crops and then come up with money. So we are looking at uh, promoting them back in the village so that they can look after their land. Jack Lapave, Jr. National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We go for a break now and we'll be back with more of today's stories after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Lay Police Boss Anthony Wagambi Jr. released a statement today condemning the actions of the men who assaulted Post Korea Lay's senior journalist Frankie Kapin last Friday. Mr. Wagambi said he does not condone such actions towards journalists and calls for those aggrieved by media reports to engage in proper dialogue with the journalists. He said the men are accountable for their actions, further adding that staff of MPs and high office holders must act professionally. Four men involved in the assault were arrested and charged with assault and drunk and disorderly behavior and will appear in court this Wednesday. Maprik Town Mayor Paul Dingo wants outstanding functional grants to support his office. Mr. Dingo says funds allocated for 2017 and 2018 remain in doubt, giving little space for the administration to operate. His administration is currently being supported by internal revenue collected from market fees and other urban levies. Establishment grants uh, for the start of the LG. The Maprik mayor says delaying of funds allocated for his administration has been a worry. Mr. Dingo says the national government must keep to its word and release those funding. He says this has been a major setback in his administration. And over the years, there was no uh, LGSRP, what we call uh, local level government support improvement program funds. Uh, those funds were also not forthcoming. And I found it very, very difficult in order to implement all my plans over these five years. Over 800,000 is yet to be collected as functional grants by the Maprik Urban Council. Many projects initiated by Mr. Dingu and his administration remain incomplete. One of them is the new Urban Council office and the courthouse. Uh, I'm now calling on the national government uh, to put in place quickly 
uh, to back date or if possible whatever the funds they can put in place including the the establishment grants which uh, i did not obtain uh, at the start of the lg submission with the electoral commission announcing that the lg elections are nearing mr dingu wants projects to be completed he says if another mayor is appointed the outstanding grants must be released so it's a very very sad scenario i'm not very happy uh, the funds i'm still lacking and the uh, the, the billing is yet to be fully completed. Unfortunately, it cannot be completed because due to lack of funds. Mayor Dingu is now using levies collected from services provided within Maprik Town. So I managed to save these uh, funds over uh, three years, in fact four years. So it took me quite a while. So I have to come with uh, about uh, 300,000 or so, uh, including the, uh, uh, some support from the uh, uh, PSIP funds. Jack Lapava Jr. National MTV News. RSPCA PNG's first fundraising event for the year has raised enough to purchase five much needed items from their wish list. The longest lunch held yesterday at the Airways Hotel helped RSPCA raise well over 48,000 kina. The top five much needed items that RSPCA is now able to purchase are an orthopedic pack, a suction unit, animal scale, a diagnostic set for operating, and a blood pressure monitor. RSPCA General Manager Helen White said with the construction of the new clinic, the items will raise RSPCA's ability to give great animal care at a new higher standard. The long-established security partnership between Papua New Guinea and Australia took place today in Port Moresby for the fourth annual Australia PNG Bilateral Security Dialogue. The dialogue underlined our keen interest in maintaining regional stability and security amid an increasingly complex and changing strategic environment. Discussions focused on how PNG and Australia can build our strategic partnership through continued cooperation on regional security issues. Regional health security, border security, biosecurity and fisheries were identified as essential to the shared strategic interests of both countries. Here with National MTV News, stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to National MTV News. Turning overseas now, United States President Donald Trump does not see Robert Mueller's indictment of 13 Russian nationals and three Russian groups for election meddling as a victory. Instead, he blames political discord in the U.S. on the Russia investigation itself. But the Russian troll factories that produce fake political ads during the election are very real, and the people behind them have very real goals. This is the only glimpse we have of a Russian troll factory in action. The undercover video was recorded inside the secretive Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, where paid Internet provocateurs worked 12-hour shifts distorting the U.S. political debate. CNN spoke to a Russian journalist who went undercover there as an Internet troll in 2016. The US elections are the key issue for the Kremlin, and of course Russia has invested a lot of effort into them. That's why the troll factories are working, I have no doubt. And this is the publicity-shy Russian oligarch, now indicted in the US for bankrolling the troll factory. Yevgeny Prigozhin, dubbed by Russian media as Putin's chef, has lucrative catering contracts with the Kremlin, but denies any involvement in election meddling. Americans are very impressionable people, he told Russian state media. They see what they want to see. I have great respect for them. I'm not at all upset that I'm on this list. If they want to see the devil, let them see one, he added. But the possible extent of Prigozhin's alleged involvement in the often shadowy world of Russian foreign policy is only now starting to emerge. He's already under U.S. sanctions for supporting Russian forces in Ukraine. And now, through a complex web of relationships, he's suspected of links to covert Russian mercenaries deployed in Syria, where CNN has reported several were killed in a recent U.S. airstrike. Prigozhin denies any connection to the group. Whatever the truth, Putin's chef and his network of secretive companies seem to extend far beyond the kitchen. The Cancer Society says urgent action must be taken to improve cancer survival rates. 
It comes after studies found in Australia with most, type, most types of cancer have a better chance of surviving than anywhere else. John Cox, better known as Coxy, is used to fronting the camera to talk building. Today he's talking about something a bit more personal, the terminal kidney cancer he was diagnosed with in 2016. My prognosis at the time was two years, uh, which I've just about got to. The publicly funded drug that was shrinking his tumours has stopped working. His only option now, paying $112,000 a year for the drug Keytruda. When you've got a disease that is going to kill you and there's no other options, you pay. The news that Australia has higher rates of cancer survival doesn't surprise him. He believes they have better treatment options. Cancer Society's medical director Chris Jackson agrees. And the things we need to do differently are things like better detection, prevention and treatment for cancer. The Concord 3 study looked at five-year cancer survival rates across 71 countries. New Zealand rated among the highest but lagged behind countries like Australia with most cancers including the four most common ones, women's breast cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma and lung cancer. Well, this shows that if we did things differently, we could have saved 2,500 lives over the last five years. The Minister for Health, David Clark, would not go on camera, but says this government will invest more in the health sector, in particular prevention, early detection and timely treatment. And if there are any lessons to be learned from Australia's approach, they will be considered. One thing Cox hopes the sector will consider is funding the patient and not just the drug. So if one treatment doesn't work, there is funding for a plan B. The first person to live for 500 years has already been born. That was just one of the futuristic predictions from the digital conference in Auckland. Another prediction, cheap or even free power for everyone. This is a prediction of biblical proportions. Noah, played here by Russell Crowe, was supposedly 500 when God said build the ark. He's going to destroy the world. Futurist Graham Codrington, played by himself, says that could become reality. I know that the guys who are working in this space are saying the first person to live to 500 years is probably already alive. This space is called CRISPR technology. It's a way to edit your DNA. At the end of every single day, a little piece of your DNA falls off at the end of your, each of the DNA strands. If we could put that back on every day, we'd literally stop you ageing. CRISPR technology is in the experimental stages, but Codrington says living longer is already a fact. Uh, half of all the people who have ever turned 80 are still alive. Graham Codrington's here for the Digital Nations 2030 Summit, a mass meeting to map out a digital future for everyone, including the 150,000 Kiwi kids who still don't have internet access. Digital inequality is becoming a new measure of poverty. It's going to become more important um, as we are more and more dependent on a digital economy. The tech sector is growing rapidly and is now our third largest export earner. So the government's in the middle of trying to recruit our first ever chief technology officer someone charged with providing a plan for the digital future. Tricky when technology changes so quickly, even to the point where futurists are predicting free energy. How? A massive nuclear fusion reactor, which generates far less radioactivity than a normal nuclear plant, is being built in France. And that promises to turn seawater into free energy. I mean, it's remarkable. You, you think I'm making this up. It's basically a star. It's what happens in the sun every day, and we're building a star. And the way life is lengthening, you may well live to see it. The gold and sunshine coasts in Queensland have been a surface paradise in recent days because of huge seas after Cyclone Gita. Well, the swell has attracted thousands of surfers, but it's also lured towing jet ski riders, and there have been a few close calls. For the fourth day in the row, the majority of Gold and Sunshine Coast beaches have been closed to swimmers. That's courtesy of huge seas whipped up by Cyclone Gita off the Queensland coast. Now, over the weekend, lifesavers here on the Gold Coast told swimmers to stay out of the water. Most listened, a lot didn't. There were more than 50 rescues. Today, there are still people who are taking a risk, but generally the beaches have been clear of swimmers. Now, it's been great days for surfers. On the southern points of the Gold Coast, it's Snapper and Kira and Greenmount. The waves have been huge, two to three metre swells, barrelling waves. Hundreds of surfers are out there enjoying it. 
But there have been a few issues. A number of jet ski riders are causing problems for some board riders, getting in the way and causing some danger. You know, it's always better if they keep their distance a bit and, um, you know, it's totally paddleable, so they shouldn't really probably, you know, be out there, but, um, you know, what do you do? There's some bad news for board riders and some good news for swimmers, with conditions expected to ease in the coming days. Back home now and since the year 2014, more than 820 million kina has been invested by ExxonMobil PNG in various development areas, much of these centred on its project sites. At a recent stakeholder engagement event, EMPNG Managing Director Andrew Berry acknowledged the partnerships forged between ExxonMobil and its partners, primarily community organizations, government agencies, aid agencies and NGOs. Some of these organizations were present at the event and provided insights into their partnerships with ExxonMobil PNG. According to Mr. Berry, through these partnerships, talent from all participants were being used to improve access to education and healthcare elevate women's initiatives, enhance livelihoods, and protect the country's extraordinary biodiversity. As PNG focuses on APEC this year, Mr. Berry re-emphasized on the need to continue to work together to deliver programs that are efficient, drive positive development, and will benefit the livelihood of Papua New Guineans in the long term. Here with National MTV News, Trukai Sports is up next. I'll be back with the details. Stay tuned. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. We begin with Rugby League and this week will be a busy week for the SPPNG Hunters and the Lace Next Tigers as they prepare to take on the Brisbane Broncos and Nandi Aviators respectively. The international doubleheader will be played at the National Football Stadium on Saturday. Coach Michael Marum will be naming his team to take on the Brisbane Broncos tomorrow at the NFS. The team might be missing Captain Ase Boas' three-hand injury. On Thursday, the Lace Next Tigers will be visiting Cheshire home and at 12 p.m. the Nadi Aviators arrive. After the Aviators arrive, a photo shoot with the Melanesian Cup for both captains will be held at the Gateway Hotel. Then at 1 p.m. on Thursday, the Brisbane Broncos will arrive at the Jackson's International Airport. As part of the Broncos' community engagement, they will visit Vabukori Village on Friday at 9 a.m. Then at 11 a.m., selected players from the Broncos and Hunters team will have fan engagement activities at the Vision City Mall. On Saturday, the first of the international doubleheader will kick off at 12 p.m. between the Aviators and Tigers, followed by the Hunters and Broncos match at 3 p.m. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. A 20-member squad has been named for the Commonwealth Games Rugby League Tournament. This will be trimmed down to 15 players before they travel to Brisbane on Thursday. The squad was named following the successful PNG Super 9s competition held in Goroka on the weekend. The side consists of players from the Intercity Cup competition. Papua New Guinea will be defending the gold medal won at the last Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Former Hella Wigman players have called on Chairman Andy Hetra to step down before the start of the 2018 Intercity Cup season. The former players say Hetra has not performed in the last five years as chairman of the team. They are disappointed with the way selection of players into the team was made, resulting in him being asked to step down. Seen uh, any changes in Hella? He have uh, he never implemented uh, strategies. The very proper strategies in Hella strategies to in order to uh, establish the rugby league, junior rugby league in Hella. No proper recreational uh, structures, uh, no funding as a chairman. He's uh, in absence of his. So we don't worry about the player, and I mean, we we want only the board to step down and let the technical officials and the player to remain, and the person who are capable to uh, run the competition can step in and then run the competition and lead the team forward. A person who have a heart in Hela. And don't go away, we'll have more of Trukai Sports after these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. 
Welcome back to Trukai Sports. PNG's top three powerlifting champions, Vagi Henry, Linda Pulson and Kalau Henry, will represent the country at this year's World Powerlifting Championships in Canada. The trio are currently training at the Tarama Aquatic Centre. Ranked number two in the world for the sport of powerlifting, PNG's Linda Poulsen, who is currently preparing to regain her title as world number one at this year's event. Linda was the world's best powerlifter in the 72 kg when she competed at the World Championships in Finland in 2015. Now we had a me ranked second in the world. Uh, me, me like trying best for me, me like come up once, I was me not working. Me, me will try training the HPTC, or me will train the HPTC, but me ask him, suppose, in a me plow, get up and train one time, look and push me go on top. So, okay. yeah. Vagi, who wants to be a world champion one day, says it is possible to achieve that sport if proper training is provided. He's a very strong athlete that um, I would like to be one day. So, yeah, for Jesa Wepa, I know that I am coming up and there is nothing impossible. If I can achieve these feats in uh, two years, who knows, I can, who knows what I can achieve in the next two years again. So it's all up there. Now I'm more committed, determined, and um, I know there'll be a lot of sacrifices, but I'm willing to take that forward. Meanwhile, local community coach Tom No says watching both Vagi and Kalau become professionals in their sport is inspiring. At least they have to be there to train, to motivate each other, as well as some of the athletes to help each other out, or at times, they usually use uh, the local gym down there at the village yeah. due to uh, like bus fare constraints. We have a gym nearby there at the village which they could use. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. And for the full interview with those powerlifters, tune in to Sports Scene at 8 pm right here on MTV. Australia's David Morris will contemplate packing away the skis after missing out on the aerials finals in Pyeongchang. There was a backlash over the judges' scores that ended his campaign, but the high flyer still managed a smile, admitting he broke down on the mountain while thinking about his mum. In aerial skiing, there are no second chances, just sudden death. David Morris, you're an acrobatic genius! So when Dave Morris landed his first jump in the final, fans and family thought he was through, especially after this. And Jay-Z goes down. Chinese challenger Jia Zongyang botched his landing, but in a jaw-dropping decision, the judges' scores pushed the Chinese through and Dave out. His Olympic career comes to an end. Can't do anything about it. That's, that's the nature of judge sports. But there was outrage elsewhere. Social media lit up. Even the Queensland police. If only we had jurisdiction over Pyeongchang because David Morris was just robbed. He was not in control on that landing and he fell over. I'm in disbelief. But 33-year-old Dave had more important issues on his mind. Finally able to put the Olympics aside and deal with the grief over his mum's cancer battle. I finally allowed myself to have a full mental breakdown up there about mum got the crying and everything because I've been holding it in for months. The pair Skyped each other today. Marg had had to miss the games, watching it all from home after her diagnosis just weeks ago. It sucks. It yeah, sucks. It does. Um, but I haven't let it affect me up until this point, but now I can because I can go home. His major regret for the night, not getting to perform this, the dazzling five-twist triple somersault he nailed in practice. So now a break for Dave Morris, a chance to see the end of the games and then race home to see mum. And as for his future in aerial skiing, well that's very much up in the air, you're telling me. Do you want to, um, well we need some boys, so if you want to give it a go, I've got an extra, what is size of food are you? Yeah, let you're me nine skis, let's see how we go, yeah. His are big shoes to fill, and sadly, no one will. Australia has no other male aerial skiers in training. We won't be represented at the next Olympics. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm still in one piece. Well, it seems no sport is safe from the Russian doping scandal, with curling the latest to be rocked by allegations of a failed drug test. Curling, a Winter Games favourite, can now be added to the list of sports tarnished by the doping brush. There were tears from Alexander Kruzhelnitsky as he claimed bronze in the mixed doubles alongside his wife as they competed under the Olympic flag. But just hours after receiving his medal, Kruzhelnitsky is said to have tested positive to meldonium, the same substance for which tennis star Maria Sharapova was banned. 
Officials are waiting on a B sample for confirmation, although the Russian 25-year-old isn't hanging around, having already left Pyeongchang. The Big Air made its Winter Games debut this morning. Come on, Jess. Aussie Jess Rich finished 13th, missing the final by one spot. I came in here just wanting to land my runs, and that's what I did, so... Yeah, I can't really be more happy to do it on a world stage in front of my family. Jess Rich's journey to this point hasn't been easy. She's been plagued with injury, so much so she was forced to pull out of slope style in week one of competition. For her to be here today competing shows just how tough our winter athletes really are. Just making it here was the hardest part and being able to compete, so everything else is a bonus. 2022 maybe? Hopefully. <laughs> and after 15 kilometres, the men's biathlon went down to the wire. Frenchman Martin Foucard thought he'd been pipped on the line as he was four years ago in Sochi. But this time, the gold was his by a matter of millimetres, ahead of German Simon Schemp. The cricket now in the current Australian Test squad has the makings of a new dynasty for Australian cricket. That is according to former keeper Brad Haddon. Men have begun preparations for the upcoming series against South Africa with the help of a bed sheet. We didn't want them to get any cues and, and that from the thrower, um, so we needed to put a, a bed sheet there. It, it wasn't because um, Marshy wet the bed, it was uh, <laughs> to dry it, it was, yeah, it was all just part of uh, the drill. <laughs> the first test gets underway in 10 days. To boxing now, when Anthony Joshua's promoter has provided an insight into how life could change for Kiwi Joseph Parker if he can upset the British star and the heavyweight unification bout in Cardiff. Eddie Hearn is, of course, backing Joshua to win the fight, but he told us on Radio Live Sunday Sport that if Parker can produce something special, he'll gain a lot more than just Joshua's belts. And victory against Anthony Joshua makes Joseph Parker one of the biggest sports stars in the world. And that's the world. That's not New Zealand. And, you know, it's almost like Joshua's not just pr protecting his belt, but he's protecting his position as the biggest star in world boxing. And Parker had the opportunity to overturn that. Hearn says that if Parker wins, he'd be interested in signing an agreement to co-promote the Kiwi heavyweights in the UK. And that wraps up Trukai Sports for this evening. Up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. A shower or two expected for Papandeta with a top of 32. A top of 32 as well, but fine weather expected for Port Mosby, Daru, Kerma and Alodau. To the Mamasi region, fine weather expected in Leh and Wau. A shower or two, the order of the day for Medang, Wibek and Vanimo with a top of 32. To the New Guinea Islands region, showers expected in Lorangau, Kaveng and Buka with a top of 31, 32 degrees and showers expected for Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, a shower or two expected for Goroka and Kundiawa. Fine weather for Mount Hagen, Mendi and Wabeg over the next 24 hours. To a look at the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerma, Yule Island, Hood Point to Samurai Island, and with waters of eastern and western Milan Bay Islands, sea 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchafen, with waters of Finchafen to Vitias and Dampier Straits to Siasi Island to Long Island, and with waters of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Wiwak, Aitape, Vanimo and the northern PNG Indonesian border, sea 0.5 to 1.3 meters. And waters of Manus and its western group of islands and waters of New Britain to New Island and Bougainville, seas 1.5 to 2.5 meters.
And a look at the ocean forecast. The Coral Sea sees light with northwest to southwesterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Solomon Sea sees light to moderate with northwest to southwesterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. Bismarck Sea sees moderate to rather rough with, south, with northwesterly winds at 15 to 25 knots. And the Pacific Ocean sees moderate to rather rough with northwest to southwesterly winds at 15 to 25 knots. The details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's our new sport and weather for today, Monday, the 19th of February. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night.